Okay, welcome everyone. So today is the last seminar for the year, and then we'll resume in January. So today is my pleasure to welcome uh, Pierre Cyril Aubin Frankowski, who is the son of Aubin and Frankowska, the famous uh, mathematicians. So he'll be talking about the producing cameras underlying LQ control and camera filtering and, and their duality. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pierre Cyril. Okay, hey, um, thanks for the invitation. Don't worry, the talk will be in English. Um, so I take advantage to uh, of this presentation to just showcase some various topics I've come across uh, on in the past years. So not forgetting all my uh, nice co-authors whose portraits you see on the right. Um, uh, I used to be a PhD in uh, Min Paris Tech, uh, and there I was working on this topic of estimation control and their constraints for kernel methods. Then I did a postdoc at Dinria Sierra. Its lab is known for Francis Bach. I was working with uh, Alessandro Rudi. And now I'm a postdoc at TU Vienna, uh, working on some more uh, abstract topics with uh, Aris Denidis. So I, across those past years, I came across uh, um, some topics like kernel methods, linear quadratic optimal control, state shape constraints, uh, max plus analysis, and more optimization lately. Uh, in a bit more detail, and that's also what we're going to see in, during this talk, um, within kernel methods, I focused on uh, matrix-valued kernels or seeing the kernels as covariances of Gaussian processes, uh, which came quite useful in the context of estimation. Um, then in terms of uh, application showcased, I was working in optimization problem with an infinite number of shape constraints, like when you ask for a function to be non-negative or increasing. Uh, I tried to do the same in the max plus world where things are absolutely non-linear, uh, but uh, I won't talk during this talk. Uh, and within optimal control, I worked on state constraints, mostly either uh, non-linear dynamics or, and that's what we're going to focus, uh, linear quadratic uh, settings. And on my more recent works, but again, that's beyond this talk, will be on uh, optimization and it's around mirror descent and uh, generalization of uh, gradients. But let's focus on kernel methods and optimal control. So um, as a motiv motivation, uh, there's been quite a few works, of course, on the connections between machine learning and control theory. Uh, I cannot list them all, so I, I, here I don't list any. I'm just asking the question, uh, what kind of object should you focus uh, if you'd like to apply machine learning in control theory? Uh, there are many. Uh, there could be the trajectory, the control, the vector field, the Lagrangian, the value function. And basically from a machine learning perspective, you'd like to say, I want to learn one of these objects. Of course, this totally depends on the available data uh, and um, I will restrict this myself to a uh, narrower question. What is the most principled or theoretically grounded application of kernel methods in uh, control theory? Of course, you can use kernel methods. I will talk more about the topics if you don't know about them. Um, but uh, as a generic uh, tool, the same way as you would use um, neural networks. Um, but what I'm uh, in the end showed uh, was that the trajectories of linear systems uh, of uh, control problems belong actually to a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this is highly connected to the uh, duality between control and estimation problems. So uh, basically, instead of taking an off-the-shelf kernel like the Gaussian kernel, instead you find that, oh, um, optimal control problems have a kernel within when they are of the linear quadratic type. So um, I will just do a, a quick overview of what I'll cover during the talk, and then I'll go back more precisely on some uh, on the topics. So. Uh, if you're presented an optimal control, so for instance, you look at this minimization problem over here, it's like, I'd like to find a trajectory that is in this space of control trajectories that is um, for each uh, trajectory x, uh, there is a u such that x prime equals ax plus bu, um, and uh, you optimize over uh, the trajectories and their controls uh, with the constraints that of those dynamics with a nonlinear uh, terminal cost, for instance, 
and some quadratic running cost that tells you uh, this is the price you pay to reach somewhere. And you have a constraint where you tell where you should start in general. Um, just as a remark, uh, imagine that B is invertible. Uh, this is a pseudo inverse, but just imagine it's uh, invertible. Then if you give me a controlled trajectory, I can always recover a control that corresponds to it. When I take the pseudo inverse, it's just the right notion because I'm minimizing the quadratic norm of uh, U to not to require B to be invertible. So now let's say that I just say that my control is equal to this uh, formula, then I don't have to optimize over the control anymore, but just over the trajectories. And the right-hand side, I replace U by this value. I will call this a square norm on the trajectories. Then if you've done or seen some kernel ridge regression, then what's on the right-hand side is precisely it. The only question is, is the space I'm optimizing over actually a uh, RKHS? It is the case. It has a kernel, and the kernel can be computed in closed form. Uh, so this is uh, one example of such kernel. It resembles the gramming of controllability, and I will show you why. Um, then you can use some uh, representative theorem to say that you only need one coefficient to solve uh, this problem. So I will go back to this aspect of linear quadratic optimal control, but that will be the focus, how to write uh, optimal control problems on um, kernel form. Then uh, in common estimation, so this is the other hat of control theory, um, you have a problem like you'd call it smoothing or filtering where you say, okay, there is this uncontrolled, like there is no control here. It's just, I have um, underlying uh, hidden uh, process uh, X. I have my observation process Y. Uh, I have my uh, observation matrix H that converts X to Y. And there is some noise W and B uh, assumed to be Brown, uh, Brown and Nose. Um, then the question is, can I estimate the uh, hidden state uh, based on my observations? And one such way is to uh, focus on the minimum mean square estimator. Uh, that is uh, this um, conditional expectation of X uh, knowing the sigma algebra uh, created by the observations. So uh, this object here, you can, uh, in because we're in this uh, linear quadratic context, uh, you can look for it as a um, linear estimator. That is, you try to find some matrix S that converts Y into X, and this X bar is just the uh, mean of uh, X when it's uh, non-affected by noise. So how to find uh, the best S? Uh, uh, my estimator, then I define the error um, between uh, the uh, hidden trajectory X, my uh, estimator, and I will pick the S as the one that has the least variance across all estimators on some given time zero to T. Um, so no kernels so far, but if you have this um, uh, variance, actually, instead of putting just S, you can also put a T over here, and then you would have a covariance of the process. And uh, I will just define the kernel as being the covariance of the optimal error. Uh, this is not a closed form form a formula, but that's the natural way of seeing where kernels pop up in estimation problems. And it so happens that the formula that I've sh just shown here is exactly the value, in some cases at least, but you'll see that the formula is match, uh, um, of the uh, Gaussian problem. And that's the um, uh, connection between uh, filtering and control. Uh, they share the same kernel, that is the kernel of the um, optimal error in one case and the kernel associated to the RKHS of control trajectory in the other. So, um, <laughs> Starting with take home messages, just uh, so that I can repeat them uh, often enough. Um, so you want to find an RKHS in some problem like optimal control, because you know that it will allow for simpler computations, thanks to the representative theorems and the kernel trick. Um, and what I will show you is that this linear quadratic optimal control uh, actually uh, has 
at its core, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that corresponds to the vector space of controlled trajectories. So in a sense, linear quadratic optimal control is a subset of kernel methods. Um, in linear estimation, it's more natural to have covariances uh, appearing, and those covariances are precisely the kernels. So the nice thing is that it, um, involving this kernel framework uh, and mixing it with some tools known, uh, the Cati equation and the like, uh, I can provide some co uh, new formulas for the covariances of uh, Gaussian processes. For instance, if you know the Saka Solin book, uh, some of those formulas are generalizations. Okay, so we've just seen why am I interested in this connection between uh, kernel uh, control and estimation. I will then uh, focus on the optimal control part for the most time. I will show that it actually uh, go extends naturally to PD control of linear case, also known as infinite dimensional uh, control. Um, then we'll see uh, estimation and I will uh, summarize what we've seen. So um, in this talk, there are four articles presented. I'll give the references at the end, two of which are done with my uh, co-author, uh, Alain Benzoussan from UT Dallas. Uh, all the code is available online and the articles are on archive. And if you go to my website, there are uh, more slides on uh, each of those. So, okay. I had just thrown at you the um, uh, optimal control problem. Um, then let me go a bit more in detail. So here you have a canonical linear quadratic problem. So the first term is your initial condition. It tells at time t0, I want to be equal to x0, and this uh, chi is my indicator function. G of xt is my uh, terminal cost. It tells me I want to be close to a given target, for instance. Imagine a quadratic error with respect to some reference. The term in red I will go, uh, I will talk about it a bit later. Imagine that this T ref is just the final or the initial time and it's a, like a quadratic penalization. Uh, then you have um, running costs that is of quadratic type, so quadratic in the trajectory, quadratic in the control. And you have the dynamics. Here it's a linear problem, so it's x prime equals ax plus b eu. Uh, all the matrices a, b, q, r can uh, depend on time. And uh, I will add for the fun of it, um, the problem of state constraint, meaning I would like my uh, trajectory X to remain within some part of the space. You can imagine that this thing encodes a polytope, for instance, or I'm asking for some coordinate of X to always remain negative. So this kind of constraints. And I ask this at a given set of uh, constraint times, which can be the whole time interval T0, T. So in terms of uh, the um, dimensions and all, uh, it's fairly general. X is in RQ, U in RP, Q and P can be uh, any dimension, uh, finite for now. Uh, the reference time is something between T0 and T. Uh, and then my matrices A, B, Q, R, uh, all of those, they can live in L1 or L2. I want to focus on the quadrat linear quadratic case the, that is implicitly convex. So Q is a semi-positive definite and R is strictly semi-positive definite. I can lower bound it by some R. Uh, the constraints, they were required to be continuous. So um, when I'm showing this problem in two lines is because actually, if you come more from the machine learning side, you can say, okay, I have this function I'd like to find, that is this my x, and I would like to uh, put um, empirical risk minimization, regularized type of problem. Well, actually the first line is precisely a loss problem, meaning I want my trajectory to interpolate x0 at time t0 and to be close to some something at a later time uh, capital T. And the second line is actually what will define the uh, quadratic norm. And that is basically my regularizer. You can in, uh, have an intuition for it. If x is equals, if u equals zero, and my initial condition is zero, then x is also zero. So the second line is completely zero. So it corresponds to the intuition. If I don't have any uh, movement, then I don't pay nothing. And my norm is uh, not. Um, okay, 
so why do I focus actually on those state constraints? Just a little uh, about them. Uh, if you come from control theory, then uh, you know Pontryagin's maximum principle, you know that when there are state constraints, it's quite involved because basically you have some Lagra uh, Lagrange multiplier for the state constraints. Those functions are uh, mean, they can be bounded variations. Uh, so um, it's not easy at all in terms of topic. Um, in terms of numerics, uh, you also have a problem. So imagine we are in a Latin country and we have some uh, traffic control cameras. You uh, only check from time to time the speed of your vehicle where a lightened driver will just speed over speed in between two cameras. So meaning if you try to discretize the, con the speed constraint, then uh, it will be violated at, uh, in, on every interval between two cameras. So um, this can lead to overshooting, to problems in terms of uh, implementation. So um, I use this problem of state constraints to showcase the usefulness of kernels. Since we're talking about kernels, let me finally give you the definition of it. So um, what is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space? It's a Hilbert space of real valued function over some set, T. Uh, why kernel? Because there is a kernel function that is a function of two variables that is real valued, such that this function K dot T belongs to the Hilbert space and you want to uh, reproduce the evaluation operation, meaning if you evaluate a function of the RKHS at point T, then you just do the inner product between F and K of T. If K of T was the direct mass, uh, then it would be precisely this operation. And that's all you uh, can say about RKHSs. It's a subclass of Hilbert spaces of functions that is nice with respect to pointwise convergence, meaning um, the direct mass is continuous over the arc edges. Okay. An example of such, sub-LF spaces. Uh, whenever you have the sub-LF condition where, um, so my uh, set of state or definition will be uh, RD, then if S is strictly greater than uh, D divided by two, then it's an arc uh, If you take, for instance, the H10 space on the real line, uh, then uh, there is a kernel for it that is the famous um, minimum of TS that is also the covariance of the Gaussian of the running motion. So um, you can have this point of view of going from a Hilbert space to a kernel, but for most people, you would pick the Gaussian kernel or the polynomial kernel, and you don't care so much about the Hilbert space. The reason for that is that you have some nice tools for computations. Uh, representative theorems goes back at least to Waba in the 70s. Uh, an easy version is in this uh, famous Shokov uh, smaller paper, basically saying if you have a problem that is in the empirical risk minimization form with uh, loss function plus some regularizer, if the regularizer is strictly increasing, like square norm, then you don't have to look for your solution in the whole space, but only on a subset of it, that is the one uh, described by the times, in our case, that's what the TN will be, where your function has to be evaluated. So um, in other words, optimal solutions lie in a finite dimensional subspace. This is a necessary condition. And if you have an control pro uh, like an optimization problem with a finite number of evaluations of F appearing in the description of the problem, then you have a finite number of coefficients. And the good thing is that on this subspace, you can do um, inner product. You just use bilinearity and the reproducing property known as the kernel trick. And you are able to compute any inner product between elements of the subspace without ever having to know what is the actual inner product. For instance, you don't need to know what's the inner product of H10 so long as you know which kernel is associated to it. And that's the reason why for, I would say, most people in kernel uh, practitioners and theoreticians in the kernel world, you don't care too much about the inner product. Uh, in my case, I will start from the RKHS to find the kernel, the kernel. So it will be important to actually know what is the RKHS. Um, a bit more uh, niche within the kernel theory, uh, you have uh, you, the focus for vector valued functions instead of uh, real valued functions. 
Um, why is it interesting for us? Because we will be focusing on uh, spaces of trajectories. Um, so uh, typically a trajectory, you could have it real valued, but it's not very fun. It's much nicer to have a radio theory that uh, extends to uh, vector valued. And uh, RKHS theory provides you uh, the same context of reproducing property, except that instead of having a real valued kernel, you need now need a matrix valued kernel. And that's the connection with the Gramian. Uh, so you have your kernel function that is now matrix valued. You apply it to a co-vector P uh, that is for, for now just a vector in RQ. And you would recover then a function in the RKHS. And it's the um, inner product between P and F of F of T that is written through the reproducing property and not just F of T. So um, again, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the kernel and its RKHS. That means in particular, because for us, T will be the time interval. If the time interval changes, or if the inner product, which will be the quadratic cost changes, then the kernel changes. Um, the uh, nice property of having a representative theorem still holds. So it's a bit uh, written in a more complicated way, but basically if you have an objective with finite a number of evaluations of your um, function that this time is vector valued F, you can also have constraints I will not talk too much about it, but just saying you can have objective and constraints, then you can look for a solution that is exclusively of the form, um, the sum of the kernel functions at the evaluation times, either in the constraints or in the objective times a co-vector, which you have to find. And the co-vector is just um, proportional to the coefficients of the function that appeared. So for instance, imagine, I'm optimizing over a vector valued function, but I'm penalizing or interpolating only the first uh, component, then only the first component appears in the P, uh, that would be uh, C equals E1. But the kernel function can do some mixing of the effect of the first component, and thus doesn't mean that the solution is of course only on the first component. Okay, so. We have our uh, computation tool. Let's go back to uh, optimal control. I will define a vector space of control trajectories. That is the set of X such that there is a U satisfying X, uh, uh, satisfying X prime equals AX plus BU. This is a vector space because if you um, do um, sums of control, you get sums of trajectories. Um, also, if I have an element in this space, I can always take the control as being the pseudo inverse of B applied to X prime minus AX. So any, any U that satisfies this uh, will be a control that generates the trajectories. Among these controls, I will pick the one that has the least square norm uh, because I have uh, in mind that uh, this is the less costly control all of them generating the same trajectory, I can at least choose the one that is uh, the less costly. So I give this um, uh, vector space of function an inner product, which I simply derive from the cost of the quadratic uh, the, uh, optimization problem. That is the, this formula here. So um, imagine, for instance, that just Q equals zero and R is equal to identity, in which case, this uh, running cost is uh, simply the um, uh, quadratic cost in control. Then um, I have on the left hand side my state constraint problem of um, optimal control. And to the right hand side, I have a kernel reach regression where I simply said I put that u is equal to this thing and I limit myself to the trajectories that were controlled. And Last question, does this uh, space F of X is actually, um, that is the same as this S T zero T, sorry, I changed notation. Um, uh, is this space the uh, RKHS? The answer is yes, you can, my original proof was based on uh, topology and showing that it has a Hilbertian topology stronger than point-wise convergence, but you can also uh, guess the kernel. 
So um, you have a lemma in this uh, Siam control optimization paper. It was the original uh, connection between RKHS and control, to my knowledge, um, in the setting. And I will now show you actually how you can derive the control. So um, the issue, I said that this thing was an inner product. If I had GRF equals to zero, then I could have a trajectory that had no control, but that was not null if, for instance, Q is equal to zero, because it would be just a trajectory that satisfies X prime equals AX. And it has no cost because it has no control. So the reason why I'm adding this one point, uh, uh, extra term is to make sure that this thing is actually an inner product. So um, I have my inner product divided in two parts. I uh, can have an intuition that I should split my space also into two parts. Uh, one part will be the uncontrolled trajectories, all the ones that have x prime equals a of x, and they will be penalized by the first term. And the other part is the trajectories that are controlled, but that have no initial condition, and they will be penalized by the second term. Um, then the kernel divides into two parts, the sum of the kernels of the two subspaces. The first subspace is non-controlled, so it's actually finite dimensional. It only depends on the initial condition, and it's not hard to show that the kernel has this form where phi a is the resolvent of x prime equals a x. Uh, for simplicity, you can just imagine it's exponential of a s minus t zero when a is uh, uh, time invariant. The other part is not hard to get either. You just use the reproducing property variation of constants and you get uh, this formula here. This formula, if I take S to be equal to T to be equal to capital T is known as the gradient of controllability in uh, textbook uh, optimal control, like things last since the 60s. Um, and I will show you quickly why it's uh, connected. <clears throat> Imagine I want to, I start at point zero time zero, and I would like to go somewhere. If I want to reach that somewhere exactly, this xt, I can put an indicator function here. And then I penalize the trajectory through the quadratic cost of the control used. Um, I can also not ask an exact planning, just a relaxed planning with j of xt. Now, since x0 is equal to 0, then x belongs to the space of trajectories with initial condition. And this space, I just said that it had a kernel that was this k1. And now that's where it's quite nice, because if you look at this problem, there is only one time request about the trajectories, that is what happens at time t. So that means that the solution through the representative theorem has a single coefficient, that is a vector, pt, that's applied to time t, and um, you have the kernel function that um, allows you to compute the other values. So if you want to reach precisely a given xt, then it means that xt has to be equal to k1 t t p t. So it has to belong to the image of k1. That is a classical condition um, or that you can go anywhere you want in space provided your kernel, your uh, gramian of controllability is invertible, and that's this condition. Now, if you have G that is C1 convex, then this time you can do, um, this part will just be the quadratic norm of X. You can, um, uh, you replace uh, X bar by this expression. A little computation shows you that this is the function that is above. Um, you take the gradient of it for the first order optimality condition, you get this, and you see that it's enough to just take pt equals minus the gradient of this term that is the x bar t. And this is known as the transversality condition. So it's nice because from the representative theorem, you recover some basic facts of uh, optimal control without ever knowing much about optimal control. Okay, I'll go quickly on this, but just to say there is another tool in optimal control that is the um, uh, Riccati equation. Uh, there is also a connection with the kernel. The kernel depends on the time interval that is cho uh, chosen. If you give more time to reach a target, then the way you compute your energy is different. So um, here it's a case where this T ref is just the final time. 
This is a um, Riccati equation, A transpose J plus G A minus a quadratic term in J plus a constant. And basically what is the kernel? The kernel is the inverse of the Riccati matrix. Um, and uh, you can compute it through a Hamiltonian system. I will not go into the details of this, but it exists uh, and it can be even computed close one. So um, in classical uh, optimal control, in general, what you say is I'm somewhere, what is the control I, I should use? You compute from the trajectory based on the Riccati matrix, what is the co-vector P, and you, uh, through the Hamiltonian, uh, derive what's the connection between the co-vector and the control, and you say, this is the control I should use, and whatever is in between the state and the control is the gain matrix. So this is a very online approach, because you are somewhere, you want to know which is the control that you should use, and the control lives in the derivative of the control uh, of the trajectory. Whereas kernel methods, they don't tell you this at all. What they tell you is the optimal trajectory is the kernel matrix applied to some um, initial co-vector. You have to find this one. You can do so by uh, inverting. Um, it's an offline approach. It's uh, not meant really to compute the control as rather to get directly the trajectory. It's smoother because you compute the trajectory and not the control. So it's an um, integral approach. You can actually see this as a green kernel applied to something. We will see more of the connection in the coming slides. Okay, um, I guess it's a good time to uh, show that it's actually implementable, all this, unless you have questions, um, I'm happy to take. Um, so uh, this is a toy problem of optimal control. You are, uh, you start somewhere, um, you can imagine that you have a um, submarine that goes at constant speed forward and uh, it has to avoid the floor and the ceiling of some cavern. So basically this last line is the constraint that Z should be between the uh, floor and the ceiling. Um, and this is some uh, equation where I control the acceleration of Z and there is some damping term. Okay, it's just for the fun of it and having a, a small toy problem. Uh, first thing I do is I um, write it in the standard control way uh, that is uh, increasing the state instead of just focusing on the uh, altitude position. I do the altitude and its derivative. I find that there is a matrix A and matrix B that allow me to write it as X prime equals AX plus BU. Now I have a state that is um, in uh, two dimensions. Okay, now what we've just seen before is that the, the two constraints of the initial condition being zero and uh, the constraints of the dynamics, I can rewrite as belonging to a uh, vector space, that is this SXU, and I can um, say that the norm of this vector space is just the L2 norm of the control. Um, so uh, I remove some constraints, meaning I will have less co-vectors, um, and I keep my uh, state constraint. So move to the others. So um, this is, for instance, the uh, closed form formula for the kernel. Uh, I have to avoid the floor and the ceiling. For simplicity, I will assume those to be uh, constant by part. Uh, that's for the implementation. And uh, I just say I want to be between floor and ceiling on every sub time interval. Uh, for now, tm minus delta m and tm plus delta m. Okay, now imagine I only request the constraints at the middle time of each interval. Then if you look at this problem, it has a, it's about optimizing over x. Z1 was just the first coordinate of x. Uh, it has a finite number of times, which was my time discretization of the, the state constraints. Um, and I know through the representative theorem that I can look for the solution on this form with some coefficients alpha that are associated to the EM. And uh, this is actually a um, quadratic programming problem because you have a quadratic objective and this is a, just an affine constraint on X. So super easy to implement. 
um, and you get this kind of uh, trajectories. You see it's a bit reckless. The other thing you can do is also uh, plot what is the um, coefficient alpha associated to each uh, time. And you see that there are only four active alphas that actually correspond to the times where your trajectory was touching the constraints. Uh, for people who would have done support, uh, support vector machines, it's not a surprise because um, if the constraint is not active, then uh, you should not have a coefficient. And that's precisely what happens whenever you don't touch the border. Um, the article itself in uh, Cycon talks a long, uh, for uh, quite a lot, a lot about how to add and subtract basically a number to the, the, uh, the um, top and the ceiling in such a way that you never touch them and that you are guaranteed that you never crash into the wall uh, because of an error of uh, discretizing your constraints. So if you are interested in that, um, I can talk a lot more about it but it's just a technique uh, based on second order count. Um, how all this is computed, because like it's not as if I had the simplest kernel of the world with this uh, integral and such. Well, um, I found this fairly old paper, Van Loon, and probably some similar techniques existed before. And basically tells you that whenever you want to compute a formula like this K1, you can obtain it by taking exponential of matrices. This is actually the Hamiltonian matrix. And uh, you uh, just uh, symmetrize it, and you will have a closed form expression for K1. So the only numerical error is in computing exponential matrices. Uh, Van Loo did it only in the triangular case. I put a little um, appendix where I do it for the general uh, square uh, matrix case. So um, if you're interested in how to implement it, it's uh, detailed in one of the papers. Um, OK. This was the linear quadratic problem in finite dimensions. Can I do it in infinite dimensions? That is for uh, control of PDEs. So let's um, just recap uh, one way of solving uh, linear PDEs. Uh, you want to solve the linear uh, uh, heat equation. Um, you have some boundary constraints. Well, how do you solve it? You have to find the green kernel of this equation. That is the object that has two time variables and two space variables. That satisfies uh, this thing with a constraint um, at the end of a direct mass. And then you just replace the direct mass by an f of t, and you cannot recover the solution by um, having your kernel integral operator applied to f of t. And the kernel, we know it, it's the heat kernel. Okay. So uh, the control heat equation in the linear case is this dSU equals Laplacian of U plus V, where V is a control function. And then the question is, can I actually do the same thing that is uh, find the equivalent of the, uh, gr and the green kernel of this equation? The answer is yes. And that's precisely what I've shown you before in finite dimensions. So um, the abstract way of writing all this, you would have two separable Hilbert spaces like H is typically L2, V is typically uh, some Sobolev space, and you have an objective that, uh, strangely enough, writes exactly like the one of linear quadratic optimal control. They are uh, in finite dimensions. The, um, there are some technicalities uh, into what are the uh, A and B allowed to be in infinite dimensions, but it doesn't change that much. Just imagine that A is minus the Laplacian. This is the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to time in that case. And that's just a controlled uh, heat equation. Um, sorry for the long, uh, more precise description of uh, what are the objects I'm considering. Uh, let's not focus on uh, about that. Let's just say that, again, the first line is just a loss function. What does my trajectory has to do at the initial time and at the final time? And the second line is the quadratic norm of my uh, Hilbert space. Uh, so that's the logic between uh, behind uh, writing everything in the kernel way and the uh, dynamical constraints. Well, that they just define the space of controlled trajectories. OK. So um, again, the same problem to the left. And you see that it's written in a much more concise way on the right-hand side whenever I say that everything belongs to an RKHS. And here is the quadratic norm of the RKHS. 
so in a nutshell, um, you can solve. I didn't do it numerically for PDEs, uh, but the formulas are there and explicit, and techniques would not be very different in computing them. Um, the kernel depends on the time interval. If you change that, or if you change your dynamics, or if you change your cost, then you will have another kernel. Um, the kernel is uh, a bit like this green kernel, and the RKHS is, to my knowledge, was not known before. Uh, it plays the role of the sub LF space, basically, where do your solutions live? Um, the formalism actually even extends to mean field control uh, linear quadratic problems. So I have an article that I'm not covering in this talk uh, because it's uh, more technical, but uh, you're most welcome to have a look. And now uh, for the end of this uh, reminder of this talk, I will just um, move to uh, duality with uh, estimation problems. So uh, that's it for the, or more or less for the optimal control. Let's see what's uh, uh, the connection with uh, estimation. So a little recap, um, uh, quicker than what I've shown before. Uh, in estimation, we don't have a control. We have a hidden state uh, uh, X, some observation Y, uh, W and B, which are my Brownian motions, uh, affecting my observations in my state respectively. And what I'd like to do is propose an estimator for X based on my observations. The best one I can do from the mean square theory is the conditional probability. Uh, expectation and uh, for this I need to find the right estimator that is my s. To obtain it I defined the error and I picked the estimator that was uh, the minimum variance linear estimator, the one that had least variance. The kernel this time will be this object here that is the covariance of the optimal error. Um, there is a more straightforward connection with optimal control uh, uh, when you want to look at the estimation problems. That is when you say you'd like to um, do a least square formulation of the estimation problem. You have in here, Y could have been anything and you wanted a plug in uh, estimator S that you just uh, put on the Y. Instead, if you have a realization of the observation, you can look for the X that matches best the uh, observation. Uh, you penalize this X based on uh, this object here. That is basically saying uh, how much noise I allow on the G, on the X. And then you have some uh, extra priors on, uh, all this is priors, if you want, uh, from a Bayesian perspective, it's a prior on the observation, prior on the uh, trajectories, prior on the initial and the terminal condition. And um, to make the connection clear with RKHSs, well, we do like before, we define this subspace of controlled trajectories, and then you can just by saying that basically this term over here, that was my prior over the trajectory, I call this U. And then I have a quadratic norm that appears. It's not exactly the L of X because I'm not taking uh, the Y into the definition of the quadratic norm, but this will be an RKHS. Um, now, if you want to recover like uh, basic common filtering uh, ideas, you can do it from a kernel perspective this time. So this, the content of the argmin over here is just L of X, but where I expand the first quadratic uh, distance, uh, that's why I get those three terms. And this object here, a little computation with the reproducing property, and then you apply the Frechet derivative rather than a representative theorem. Basically, it's just like first order condition will tell you that the optimal solution is this, which is precisely what the theory of um, common filtering tells you. Now, this kernel, I can give you a closed form for it. It's a bit more complicated than the one I've shown you before, but it's always the same logic. There is one part that uh, corresponds to Gramian of uh, here controllability. And uh, the left part that is uh, something that penalizes the initial time uh, that is related to the prior at the beginning and the end. Um, okay. Uh, I will just give you the intuition now of why 
has it been known since uh, 60 years uh, that um, an estimation problem corresponds to a dual optimal control problem? Um, so let's go back uh, quickly at just the definition of the covariance and the optimal like the optimal um, estimator. It was uh, the minimum variance with respect to the error. Okay. I apply some uh, fixed lambda bar to my the error that appeared in the covariance. I expand it simply with the formulas. And the problem is this formula depends on an X that is my hidden state, and I don't want that. So how do I do to uh, remove the X? I can in create an adjoint equation that is based on some dual variables lambda that is also known as the um, information vector. I do some computations, integration by parts, but uh, and I will get that actually this is the variance of my estimator applied to those uh, lambda bar as this formula here uh, that looks very much now like a quadratic uh, objective, quadratic in uh, initial time, quadratic in the trajectory, quadratic into something. That something you can actually replace with a V. So this formula here is exactly the same as the one before, but instead of fixing the how um, the H star, uh, this is the adjoint in H affected the dual state, I just have some control V and that's optimal. Uh, sorry for the technicality of this. I just want to underline that basically here is an adjoint equation. If you have an adjoint equation, you can write a, um, a primal equation. So you have a primal dual system that is um, your Hamiltonian system. Uh, you have some initial conditions here. It's a bit ugly because you have a jump that happens at time t. Um, OK, let's see that it actually can be written much easier. Uh, just say that all these conditions, like especially the jump one, is just something that affects the system by adding a jump. That is my L mu or this L nu over there. Uh, and mu star plays the role of gamma star, uh, nu star the role of lambda star, and I get a two-point boundary problem that is very common for uh, optimal control because it's the Hamiltonian problem. And in general, people would uh, then look for the Cati equations. That's what we will do. We will say, OK, I have this abstract problem, which in some special cases will recover the original uh, system. Can I look for a solution such that mu is proportional to nu through a matrix pi, and such that nu hat is proportional to mu hat through some sigma? The two of them, we can guess that they are kind of the inverse of one another, but not exactly. Um, so you try this, you plug in, you see what is the equation that sigma or pi should satisfy. And those are actually the Riccati equations. They are dual from one another uh, because basically uh, h star r minus one h, that is h is the observation, r is the noise of my uh, observations. Well, in one case, it's constant added. And in the other case, it's within the quadratic. But you can also do something else. That is, um, say that L mu and L nu were perturbations, and you would like to find some kernel, so basically an, a kernel integral operator that sounds L nu to mu hat uh, when L nu is null, and the same in the other case. So with this, you can do some computations, check what are the equations that those k and lambda um, satisfy. I will skip all that, and I will just go straight to the solution to tell you why there is actually a nice dual uh, optimal control problem uh, that underlies the duality between uh, control and um, estimation. So um, if you remember, I was talking recently about the least square problem. I will just go back to that slide quickly. So least square. Uh, it was the typical Bayesian problem where you put priors on several aspects of your problem. And I told you, you can create a natural LKHS that would be just the quadratic norm derived from this object here. And this is exactly the same that happens here. I will just create the uh, RKHS that corresponds to the primal problem, and I can compute the kernel. 
Now, the slide will look very similar if I now move to the dual variable, that is this lambda. And this one satisfies the adjoint equation. So instead of having dx equals ffx plus, let's say, gu, you have minus d lambda equals f star lambda plus h star v. Because of the star that indicates adjoint, this is clearly an adjoint thing, and it's going backward in time because of the minus. Well, you also have a quadra natural quadratic norm on this uh, space of controlled adjoint vectors, and you can find the kernel that corresponds to it. And that is like the dual of the previous one. And um, this one here would correspond to the uh, observability gramian. So that's the duality between the two. Um, meaning, you had your least square problems of estimation. You could rewrite it by just developing the first term into several, taking the first order conditions to find the common filtering solution. And actually, this is a quadratic problem. So it's very natural to compute its dual problem that is also quadratic. And it writes like this. So there are some projections on the image space of H and the uh, or the range of H and on the uh, kernel of H star. It's a bit technical, but don't worry about it. Um, it essentially tells you there is some quadratic problem, which has an expression that involves the natural uh, quadratic norm on lambda that I've just shown you here. OK. So we have two problems. I'm reaching the end of the of the talk. Um, this inquiry was based on uh, Kaylat's book on uh, linear filtering. I think it's a 99 book, but that basically summarizes the previous 40 years. And there was in it a nice table uh, of uh, problems. And this you will find in uh, one of the articles that I will, uh, I will put the titles at the end. Uh, basically telling you, yes, you can have a visual picture of what's the duality between control and estimation and what is a primal variable and a dual variable. So whenever you have a stochastic problem that doesn't have a control, that's a filtering problem. You have associated to it a control problem that is a deterministic one. That's the second column. Then if you have a primal variable problem, in our context, where we always everything is quadratic, then we have also a dual problem uh, that is quadratic as well. So you would have a dual Gaussian process, for instance, with respect to the original linear minimum mean square error, and you have a dual control problem that is um, based on uh, the information controlled information vector. Uh, to my knowledge, this. Uh, part here is the one that has the, been the less looked into, uh, even though they are pretty nice, those uh, information vectors. Uh, if you want to move from uh, the first line to the second one, basically you do um, min, max, max, min uh, duality. If you want to move from the left to the right, you just say that instead of calling DW a noise, you say that it's a control applied, a DW equals UDT. Uh, formally, it works, and it's the one the, for this linear case that moves you from uh, filtering to the left to control to the right. Uh, so the key message is, for this is that if you look to the right-hand side in the column, the, why are there kernels there? It's because you have Hilbert spaces of controlled trajectories. Um, on the filtering problem, the kernel is the covariance of the Gaussian process of the optimal error of um, uh, those problems. And the duality is the fact that the two problems share the same kernel. Um, so hoping that it's uh, uh, you like this explanation of duality better than uh, the one classically said, that is like you have the common criterion and uh, common of the observability is the dual in the sense of permuting some rules of the one of controllability. Um, so to conclude, um, when like addressing this problem of linear quadratic uh, optimal control or estimation, it's nice to find that there is an underlying reproducing Hilbert space because you can have some simpler computations thanks to representative theorems. 
Uh, in the linear quadratic case, uh, the vector space of trajectories is the lead to find the kernel, whereas in linear estimation, the kernels are there very naturally because they are the covariances of the optimal error, whereas most people don't focus so much on what is the Hilbert space associated to this uh, covariance. Um, not fully true in the book of uh, Thomas Seignan and uh, uh, Berlinet, there is tons about it, but not with matrix valued. Everything is real valued there. Um, yeah, so um, the objective of this stream of research was to uh, draw connections between optimal control and estimation uh, based on uh, kernel lengths. I think it's more or less done, but there is probably a lot of things in um, on the controllability typically side that could be fun. Um, I did not do ever a nonlinear embedding on the state. That is the typical thing people would do in um, Kupmanism. Uh, so uh, this is uh, doable. You can connect the two. There are probably some connections with uh, Kupman stuff uh, from the PDE perspective more, um, because there you are in infinite dimensions. So first you do nonlinear embedding from finite dimensions to infinite dimensions and then linear dynamics. Um, if you are interested more in stochastic optimal control or optimization over measures through um, mean field control, then this is done in uh, one extra paper on mean field control that I've put online on in August. So uh, some more take home messages. Uh, the implementation I've done was for state constraint and it's a special case of shape constraint kernel regression. Um, if you want to look for some uh, object that you should focus efforts on, I would su suggest that control trajectories are the nice object rather than the controls to use kernel methods. And generally speaking, um, I, I would be amazed if you can just plug in a linear quadratic theory on nonlinear systems. Uh, somehow you have to linearize those problems, for instance, by taking uh, higher dimensions, which is the logic of what uh, kernel embeddings do. So um, there is probably much more to be done in that direction. Uh, last slide. So uh, the papers are presented to Don alone during PhD, which were on this uh, uh, connection between uh, optimal control and kernels. Uh, then between the Riccati equations and kernels. And then uh, this triggered the interest of Alain Benzousson and we've done um, more papers, one on uh, infinite dimensional control, like um, control of the heat equation and uh, this connection between common filtering and optimal control. And this last paper summarizes most of what came before and has the most advanced formulas. So I would rather recommend uh, this one. All these articles are on uh, archive. Uh, the code for the first article where there was implementation is on uh, GitHub. And if you need uh, anything more, just uh, write me or uh, reach out through the website. So with this, I conclude. Thank you for attention and um, open for questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, can I can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. So what I was going to ask is what about nonlinear control problems? But you've said a little bit about that at, at the end. But um, is is there more that you can say? Um, yeah, there are two things. Um, so one is uh, hoping in like in Kupmanism that you can mm. find a rewriting of your state such that a problem that was nonlinear in a given set of coordinates becomes linear in another set. So this would be one way. Then the other one is um, uh, if you take a nonlinear optimal control and you linearize around a trajectory, then you will have a, uh, a linear subspace that is basically the tangent space to your set of nonlinear trajectories. And I do think that their kernels are a natural object as like the description of kind of uh, tangent planes, planes linearization of uh, nonlinear uh, problems. So it's this typically I think could be used for, I think it's called a sequential convex uh, programming, uh, but where you would do a sequence of linearizations. If your original problem is convex, there is some luck that it could work. Uh, 
Okay, thanks. And uh, maybe just one other question. Uh, so your example of a submarine was mm -hmm. a nice one, but it made me think of optimal use of a <clears throat> of a uh, energy store like battery system or something, because uh, you have the same thing that you have. Uh, you mustn't hit max or min, uh, mm -hmm. but you want to be able to optimize. Uh, basically, there you want to optimize the amount of money you make by selling electricity when it's <clears throat> expensive and buying it when it's cheap. Yeah, the, that could be very nice. Um, uh, a little brief comment about this aspect. Uh, basically, uh, this is a conservative estimate that I, I use, but it's implementable and guaranteed. So that's the positive things. The other thing is the kernel is completely computed offline. So basically in the solution formula over here, you can just store the kernels and then you will only have to re-optimize the alphas so you don't pay the computation price all the time. This, I would say, is a fairly different mentality with respect to like mm -hmm. model predictive control style, where at every time step, you would redo a new uh, full computation of your system. Uh, if the dynamics don't change, because of course, that's what parameterizes the kernel, then it uh, could be nice for offline aspects. But again, it's only linear quadratic uh, <laughs> settings. And uh, I would not say that just uh, discretizing the dynamics and everything will not work better. It's possible, but the advantage of the technique is that the solution is in essence continuous and it satisfies the dynamics. So you don't have any discretization error uh, related to that. It's also, as I've just shown, uh, it was uh, sparse. So uh, that can be also useful because you don't have to basically store in mind all the X's and all the U's. You just store the alphas, which are the moments where you will have to uh, do something to else to uh, avoid the obstacle. Thank you. Yeah, Chris, did you, do you want to unmute and ask the question directly? Yeah, hi. Yes, thanks for the talk. I, I just wrote the yeah. summary of the question, but... Um, yeah, so you're doing control and you have kernels on time, right? And I was wondering if um, kernels indexed directly on trajectories or on path space, which by now are becoming mainstream, I hope, or I think, uh, okay. <laughs> um, could play a role in uh, in what you're doing or possibly in the nonlinear setting or the stochastic setting. Um, uh -huh. Uh, that's so. That's a very interesting point. So I learned about signature kernels only like two years ago. I, I know there is quite extensive school in uh, UK, I think mostly, uh, but not spreading. And um, my in possible intuition, but uh, since you have a kernel on the um, between trajectories, you could it could be somehow. Uh, I'll I'll take risk over here. Uh, a kind of comparisons between trajectories when lifted. And that is like a notion of quadratic norm between trajectories of a nonlinear system. So meaning uh, um, my point of view is uh, very layman style. I'm just um, linearizing stuff around a trajectory. If maybe you can concatenate all this linearization and still preserves the kind of Hilbertianity of your norm, then it could be a way of maybe connecting uh, with um, signature kernels. Uh, another way of saying uh, maybe when um, uh, when the system is uh, linear, then the signature kernel between the trajectories could be just the kernel I'm proposing over time, maybe. Maybe yeah. Um. The the, I mean the 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 starting point I was thinking about is that you you take your controlled ODE, mm -hmm. and then and then you um you somehow uh, solve it by PCAR iteration and uh you can linearize it in some sense in the control automatically mm -hmm. even if the original uh ODE is non-linear, it becomes linear in this lift 
of the uh, of the control trajectory. So, um, and then the, the the signature kernels are inner products in some sense of these lifts. Um, mm -hmm. But um, the collapse to in the linear case to what to your kernels, uh, yeah, I, don't, I I maybe yes, I, I, it's just. Um, uh, that the when you define your kernels, they don't they're not depending on the control, right? The kernels don't uh, uh, don't, no, they don't depend on control. Yeah, but in some sense, the RKHS depends on the on the control, right? So the the dependence is the, more the kernel itself only depends on the dynamics, if you want, on the A B on all the matrices that appear in the the time interval. What I was just uh, maybe guessing is that um, very, like, I will just go uh, early slide of the talk. Uh, let's see if I can find um, Yeah. So um, I was just wondering, um, in the linear space, if I take the line that defines the inner product between the x's, this could be maybe a special case of sin a signature kernel that is linear, no? Yes. So meaning what I'm doing is only the linear case of a signature kernels. The linear case of the signature kernel would be where the, con I mean, in the way I see it, it would be when the, uh, when the, the control is time, it's only given by time. Uh, is but but that's not definitely not your case, right? The control. Um, so my so yeah, my my control does not depend on space because it's all, always open loop. But that's not really the issue. The control is a very minor objects from my perspective and from the kernel aspect. I would say because you can always just give me a control trajectory, you derive the control. So the right hand side, you just should just see as some kind of sub F norm on the or sub F inner product. Uh, on the trajectories. What I'm guessing now is if instead of trying to put, put a kernel on time, that's the way I do, because I try to describe in which space does the trajectory live, maybe what you could do is to uh, forget about the control aspect or just plug in this formula of U here, and you call this an inner product between trajectories and a linear signature kernel. But that's just a guess. Uh, I'm not expert enough on signature to. Right. Right. Yeah. But in a sense, just saying that a, a very spe easy special case of a kernel is the inner product on a Hilbert space. Uh, as long as I define the Hilbert space, this object is well defined as a form of kernel on elements of the Hilbert, of the Hilbert space. And you could imagine something tougher, uh, where on the right hand side you get a more complicated formula that maybe connects somehow to signature kernels. I don't know if it's uh, clear. Yeah, thanks. I, I need to read your papers, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so I would, I would say, Mike, I was just narrow focused on the optimal control estimation aspects without trying to kernelize so much things. Uh, if your um, state object is not the, uh, like the, uh, the the object on which the kernel is defined is not time like in my case, but it's the trajectories themselves. Then I would think that this defines simply a, a natural uh, kernel between or in the uh, inner product between trajectories, and uh, maybe the signature kernel then becomes something just more complicated on the right hand side. Maybe, yeah. I mean, in the the uh, the his, historical evolution of ODEs to SDEs, uh, where basically rough paths had uh, something to say, and where these signatures came came out from, um, brings me to think that perhaps in the stochastic case, uh, where you you want to define a control or you want to identify a control that perhaps in a pathwise sense should depend also on the trajectory of the noise. Uh -huh. That was the original somehow role of rough path theory, right? To, to have a pathwise solution of SDs. Okay. Um, might, you know, in, it, it might bring in the, the, the necessity of, of having a kernel, not just on time, but also on noise trajectories, right? But uh -huh. that, that somehow 
uh, a naive guess. Uh, okay, that... um, I do have that in the paper I didn't present that is on mean field control. So basically, uh, if you write a stochastic differential equation, so in this case, you would have AX plus BU plus DW. And this, you can also have an RKHS theory in a context of stochastic dynamics. Uh, simply, uh, it's your state is not um, RQ, uh, like a finite dimensions, it's um, L of RQ times omega, uh, like uh, um, L of omega RQ. So basically the state itself becomes a um, uh, noisy process. Then the, your inner product, you just put some expectations because everything becomes um, uh, random. And the kernel uh, itself, like basically if you take a formula like this, uh, it's the same formula, but you have to put an extra term here that forces the trajectories to be adapted to the noise, essentially. So, but uh, right. my so knowledge, it was yeah. the first time that there was some kernel on uh, stochastic dynamics. Now, that's that's interest, interesting. So the, in that case, you're doing things probabilistically. So you're not doing things pathwise, right? You're for, yeah. for, for every, you're not... You, you're defining a, a, a somehow a, an optimal control solution map that is exactly. that in some almost sure sense, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, uh, and that's why you, you're saying a solution map. That's the interest. That was the interesting part because we were doing it in the context of mean field control. So that that's precisely what was happening there. Basically, uh, the tough parts of understanding the mean field control setting was saying my object should not be actually the trajectories. They sh it should be the push forward maps. Right. Um, so, and uh, because we circled a bit around on which object should we focus in. And uh, it could have been the measure on paths. It could have been a lot of things. And it ended up that the good object for having a Hilbertian theory, even in the stochastic setting was uh, push forwards. Uh, and the push forwards, uh, you can say that they are either like, Deterministic or stochastic, uh, that is, if there are no stochasticity, then they are surely determin like it's deterministic. If you have some stochastic noise, then they are deterministic with respect to the noise. And once you put a realization of the noise, then the resulting push forward is stochastic. Okay. But yeah, it's a connection. There is a, a nice connection with push forward. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the theory from a um, Hilbertian perspective was uh, completely limited to linear quadratic settings. Uh, it's not, it's kind of restrictive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thanks. Well, yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, seems not. Yeah, thank you again for the nice talk and then best wishes okay. to everyone for the holidays and the new year and see you next year then. Thanks. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks. Okay.